Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Nancy Gutierrez. She is uh, the Chief Strategy Officer for New York City Leadership Academy. And uh, thank you for joining us today, uh, handing it over to Dr. Nancy Gutierrez. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today and for allowing me to share a little bit about my, my journey with you. Um, throughout this conversation, feel free to chat in questions or make interruptions or ask for clarification. Um, don't worry, you won't throw me off I'm to, to that and, and uh, prefer kind of a discussion <clears throat> if there's anything that you want to dig deeper on or that uh, that could use clarification. And thank you. Um, to, for this opportunity to speak mentorship and the team for allowing me to do this. So what I want to do today is take you through a little bit of <clears throat> what life was like for me um, from about 16 on. Uh, and I'm 38 today. And so this is a kind of a period of 15, you know, uh, 20 years, um, more or less. And it'll kind of give you a window into um, the cost was like, what did it require to become a chief strategy officer? And I think a lot of it is going to be around uh, kind of like a very non-linear process um, of a story about really not having a specific goal in mind, but being led by passion and being led by justice and being led by um, by things that happened, you know, in your life that you begin to discover to say, hey, I want to change that or I want to do something different or I want to change experiences for people who may have experienced what I did or what my family is currently experiencing. And so I said, that's a little bit more about how this story will be. It'll be a lot more about kind of what happened throughout versus here was my goal and here's what I did to get there. Okay. So let me start with where I'm from. I am from a beautiful community out in East San Jose, California, a big Mexican community, primarily grew up around a lot of Mexicanos. Um, and um, and there, were, there was a huge immigrant population, also a huge first and second generation population within the community. Um, and this is where I spent my entire life and actually majority of my career before moving out uh, to the East Coast. Um, and this is a, a, uh, a picture from one of the immigration marches. Um, and he, this, is, this is my grandmother. And I want you to just take a minute to just look at her, to look into her eyes. And this is taken only a few years ago, but this was of the woman who brought us to this country, to my family to this country. And she carried my mom here with her and, um, and moved right directly into East San Jose. And uh, we've been there ever since. And I became a teacher and a principal in that same community. My grandma is one of the strongest women I know and one of my biggest inspirations this picture here is of her standing in front of Harvard College. Um, and <laughs> the funniest story is that she actually, uh, without speaking English and without uh, fully understanding um, what it meant to be a student at Harvard, um, took, some, took six buses, six Greyhound buses from the border of Texas and Mexico from a place called McAllen, Texas. Um, out to see me and she took six buses over three days um and um she did never even told me she was she was gonna come she told a cousin who called my mother who then sent a text to my sister who then let me know and i was on my way to new york city at the time to look for apartments and i turned back around and went to find her in boston she was sitting there next to this really nice man at a mcdonald's uh and just waiting for hours upon hours and when she found me, but she had three bags in her hand and they were of homemade salsa, or picante, she had tortillas, she had some tacos she knew I loved. I mean, she had just a bunch of food that um, she knew I needed out there on the East Coast and came all the way to give it to me. But anyway, this this is my grandma, Soledad, who um, who is is my world. Um, and here is here's my mother and here's my mother and my my um, my siblings. Um, and they are all still currently in East San Jose and not East San Jose, the San Jose area, the Bay Area overall, um, their families. And um, they really are the people that ground me and ground the work I do every single day. Uh, my grandmother, as I think, our guiding light. And then all of us as little soldiers kind of in the field doing the work 
on a daily basis, kind of across the sector, whether it's myself in education or my sister in, uh, you know, health care or my, my older brother who uh, it works at, at, at a juvenile hall um, and, and, and works with drug and alcohol dependency or my sister who's an occupational therapist and works with um, students with special needs. And so there's just there's just a real I think they instilled in us a real <clears throat> sense of service to our community. And I'm very proud of my family for, you know, for staying true to that over time. And um, I've talked a lot about this. Here are a few demographics of, oops, here are a few demographics of what the community looks like specifically. You're talking about majority free or reduced lunch, majority uh, Latino population, and um, and, and, a, and a large uh, growing, actually, um, Vietnamese population. This is my niece, Malena, to the left, and she's half Mexican, half Vietnamese. Um, every single one of my siblings actually married outside of our our race, and um, there's just some, some beautiful mixtures out there. But um, and oh, you know, sixty four percent or so English language learners. So this was the community where I uh, grew up and then became a teacher, and um, and a principal. Now to dig a little deeper about my family here. Here's my no other niece, Arissa. Arissa has special needs, and um, she um, currently attends a school. Still that same community and what something happened recently that really um, upset me and upset my family and I'll tell you a little bit about it just to give you some context as to why this work is so important. Um, Arissa basically was transferred to a school that had a special program for um, for students who um, are autistic and so she went over to this this new school uh, and she was coming home to my uh, my mother and to my sister saying um, I'm bored, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing the type of homework I need to do. And can you get me more workbooks? And so they said, of course, but my sister went over to the school uh, to have a conversation with the teacher to say, Hey, I, I think I need you to, to, can, can you up the rigor? Can you provide her with a, you know, a bit more support? Like, I feel like she's, she's not, you know, engaged in the same way she's been engaged in at her previous school. So she goes over to talk to the teacher and the teacher didn't want to talk to her. In fact, um, did not let her into the classroom, made her wait for hours. Uh, she walked over to the school principal. School principal also had no time for my sister. Um, as you can imagine, my sister's getting more and more upset, um, you know, and this is happening over a two to three day period where my sister's going back and trying to get a hold of them, going back and trying to reach them, going back and trying to, you know, wait outside the classroom and, um, it became kind of a confrontational, I think, uh, situation because the, the teacher at one point um, kind of told my sister that she um, shouldn't be doing that. She's not allowed at that school set. In fact, she didn't let her into the classroom. And she told her that, in fact, students with special needs often don't do well with homework, period, that they should not be getting the type of homework. Um, my sister got really upset and left. And uh, the next day, my niece uh, comes to uh, comes home with this, which was kind of like you know a very unprofessional um, piece of homework. Had four questions that it looked like it was like there was, it was damage on it from water, and it was ripped a little bit. I mean, and it just was a real slap in the face, I think, to our family and to the community and to kids with special needs. Um, my niece does work that is well above this grade level and well above this content. Um, and, um, and that, that, that I think those kinds of experiences continuously humble me and my family and, um, the work we do to, to remind us that it doesn't, it doesn't matter that I ended up, you know, that we ended up in the community and we're connected to, you know, to people who are doing work for justice. Like you're, there are real kids in schools, including kids in my family who are still being, um, held to very low expectations and still being, um, you know, inter interacting with folks who are educators in the field who aren't necessarily um, engaging them in ways that are respectful. Um, and, you know, and I felt really bad. My sister, you know, she um, she doesn't necessarily have the resources maybe that I have right now. And, and we definitely all support each other and do that. But I think that people will look at her and judge her. And sometimes feel like they can treat her this way because of maybe where she works or how she's dressed or how, or, you know, or because you go to this school, people assume things about you. Um, and um, anyway, it was just a really unfair 
uh, situation. We've we've sort of resolved it uh, it sense, um, but it's like a constant battle. So I wanted to share that with you just as as one of the stories I think that grounds me that happened recently. Now let me let me take you into let me zoom out from kind of my family and the personal work to what I do every day currently. <clears throat> work for an organization called the New York City Leadership Academy, and we uh, about 14 years ago, um, specifically because we were looking for school leaders, school, and specifically school leaders of color and female school leaders, so women uh, and folks of colors to lead um, our schools that were really struggling. Uh, and that was something that there was a lot of resources invested into that, and people from across the country started saying, hey, you know, what is it that you guys are doing to really create these aspiring leaders uh, for these schools? They started to come out and see, and, and eventually we ended up growing um, across the country um, and it became a national organization. Um, and we've been in two places internationally, uh, Colombia and Brazil as well. And really our mission has become around how we build the capacity of these leaders at every level to confront inequities and create conditions for all of our students to thrive. Now, I want you to keep that mission in mind with the story I told you about my niece and about the way the principal dismissed her, about the, about the inequities that my niece was facing on a daily basis going back into that school site. The fact that my sister has to fight uh, continuously to make sure her daughter's getting what she needs. Those are the types of things I think that I work every day uh, to to correct, right, to give, to, to really support our leaders out there who are so critical in this work, to do this work um, well, right? It's not easy work at all. And I can tell you right now that, um, you know, that whole situation, my my sister and my family, and we were not easy either, right? There's, we were upset. And so there's, there's a constant um, type of work you have to do that involves people, it does not involve working at a computer, does not involve every day working with, with folks and, and engaging um, in, in very sometimes hard, hard situations and conversations. Now we focus on three different levels. One is around uh, the school leader has been our, our primary piece. Um, and that could be the aspiring person, you know, aspiring school leader could be the assistant principal, could be the person who's the principal, um, him or herself along with the person who supervises them, so the district leadership, right? Um, and then a lot across those lines, we do coaching across every level. Now, let me give you a sneak peek into kind of what a training session looks like. This will be about, I think it's a four minute video, um, but you'll get a sense of kind of what a simulation uh, like experience might look like in the summer before people launch into really practicing or trying it on at their own school sites. Okay, so um, here we go. This is the fifth day of the Aspiring Principals Program Summer Intensive. These aspiring principals are in the kindergarten through sixth grade strand. We're going to do an activity called In Basket. As a principal, you will have an In Basket on your desk, and a range of things will be placed in the In Basket. You have, you have two hours, so we're simulating uh, a day within the confines of two hours. We're going to start at 9.35. And they're being handed out right now until 11.30 to complete the tasks in any way that you see fit. So from now until 11.35, principals of June to pay to six, please address the items in your in-basket. Building on the work of the first five days, the in-basket activity is aimed at simulating a day of a principal in a school so that participants engage in an authentic and intense experience resembling practice. During this activity, participants assume the role of a principal who has to make a number of decisions in a limited time. Respond to a variety of in-basket items, meet with an irate parent, observe a lesson, and go through a fire drill. The simulation is carried out in stages with some overlapping parts. The irate parent role play involves roles and scripts with volunteers acting as school secretaries and parents. Each role play is videotaped. My niece 
In the fourth grade, he's being harassed by a student. The teacher said they would take care of it. The teacher never got back to me. I'm asking you a lot of questions, and you're going to deal with it later. I want your assurances right now. You can assure that I will get back to you. No, not that you're going to get back to me. I want to know the day the class is changing. Okay. I want to close the class meeting for this lunch break. No, it's not going to be the class meeting for two classes, but... All of a sudden, you know, he walks back into his room, and, you know, he listens to his teacher and another student making fun of his name. You know, I'm just kidding. The irate parent role play begins when the principal is interrupted by the school secretary, who escorts him or her to the parent. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm definitely here to hear those concerns, and I'm glad that you're here. And uh, I'm going to make it my every effort to address everything that you're uh-huh. Well, those are nice pleasantries, but let's see what solutions we can come up with. So we got this letter this summer from you saying that a new group of students were moving into the building, which, you know, of course I was concerned about, but let me just wait and see how it turns out. And, of course, the worst has happened. They're completely different kind of kids. They're disruptive. They're disrespectful. They're clearly not interested in learning. And I want to figure out a way to get them either out of this building or completely contained and isolated because I don't want them disrupting my child's education. Right. Or any or all of those things. But if the teacher hasn't figured that out yet, then the teacher isn't confident. And if the teacher is incompetent, does that mean not my problem? Excuse me. Uh, there's a kid bleeding in the cafeteria, and the nurses are out to lunch. Um, there's a really big emergency right now, and, and they're calling you. And this is obviously, why did I come to the principal? The teachers can't deal with this evil. I'm going to give you the information now. If you can, could you write down this information, please? I'm going to give you the number. And I'll put a little child on it. Here's a pen and a piece of paper. It's just unacceptable. No student should be put in a situation where they have to listen to, you know, their teacher making fun of their name. Funny or not, it's a name that was passed on from, from generation to generation. It's his grandfather's name, his father's name. really important in my family. And I'm not really sure that anybody is, is being sympathetic to that right now. I want him to move. He's not comfortable there. So I'm hearing there's a problem with the classes in terms of his name. And I'm hearing all the I just said all of this. And uh, I'm a college advisor. I just want to make sure that I'm remembering what I need to address. A classroom observation is another part of the in basket activity. The observation is on video, and the teacher being observed is a fictional character in the summer intensive school scenario binder. <laughs> Back to section two, uh, subsection C. The debrief is used to address what surfaced for participants during the activity. <laughs> I, I always try to find the positives and things. It was intense and it was hard, and that that can't be masked. And, okay, and so let's stay with the question: What was hard? Then? Juggling the tasks and making your priorities high priority. What's dealt with first? What's dealt with after? And so on. Making a schedule to prioritize. Dealing with the parent was. <clears throat> In our minds, we had we thought something like this would be coming, maybe, and so we had planned for it. But when everything we planned for didn't work, that's when we realized this is where the learning is going to come now. Because if nothing worked, I, I didn't know what to do. The biggest thing I learned uh, with my uh, irate parent was not to touch him, which I did. And it just escalated the situation because I thought putting my hand on his shoulder would possibly calm him down, and it worked in a total reverse direction. So the mental model you bring to a situation, and your mental model reaching out and touching someone, is it okay, Phil? In your mental model, that's a confident. However, 
What was his mental model? Don't touch me. Stay awake. I'm upset with you. Move back because uh, you're not doing a great job because the school culture is, is horrible. You're intruding on my space. Right. And so the same gesture in one mental model provokes a different response in another. So that when we take our mental model and impose it on someone else without listening and getting underneath, our behavior, which has an intent, may have a different reaction. Other people experience something like that? I walked in. Parents sitting there seemed pretty calm, and I thought, okay, I have this under control, more or less. And then this guy just went off in Spanish, and I was floored. What is he saying? And I thought of getting a translator, and by the time I got up and walked over to ask, he said, it's okay, go. <laughs> so I felt like I really didn't deal with the issue, and, and like I disappointed the parent, and so I felt like inefficient in a way. So this, so you can see that um, it's very hard to be a school principal. Uh, and one of the things that, that we do around this is to to try to ensure that people are getting real life simulated experiences um, within trainings, uh, and uh, and then they actually are practicing it when they go back into their their school sites to engage. So <clears throat> I hope that gave you a little bit of a sneak peek into maybe what part of and remember this is just one day this was what you saw there was one day of a six week summer intensive it's six weeks right and if you can imagine oh, there's lots of other really great activities that kind of take place um and it's true it's true what they said which is that it doesn't matter how much you prepare when you're in the space and dealing with real life situations it's when is when you know you're really tested um and it doesn't matter how much education you have, guess what? Your ability to engage with people and be respectful and to listen and to, it, it, there is, it's a juggling act. And, um, and we try our best to really support folks to prepare, not necessarily for the details of what will happen, but for the discomfort that comes with not having any answers, right? Which is what we would, you know, we would call adaptive leadership, right? There, there are no real answers, but you, and you're okay in that space, then you can be an effective principal. Um, we also take <clears throat> a hard stance at the academy around leadership and equity, right? About how they really go hand in hand in anything and everything we do in leadership. And we do that because uh, um, it matters. It matters greatly for the work, and it's something that we value at the organization greatly. Look at the first one there around how your ability, again, to reflect on your own beliefs, your own behaviors, your own experiences. The assumptions you make about people, how you engage, like that is a, a, one of the key behaviors around leadership. There's also the second ones around like, how are you modeling a belief system that is really student-centered and, and sometimes people want you to be centered in other ways that are beneficial to them. Um, and sometimes you'll become unpopular or certain decisions that you make that are aligned and grounded in equity. If you are bringing up conversations around race to the table, there are things that people that make people very, very uncomfortable. Um, but we see we see your ability to engage uh, and to model that. And the other, there are, you know, all of these behaviors we see as, uh, as, as super important. I'm going to take you to number four there, too, around confronting biases. And this, you could also call this confronting, you know, low expectations. So you could call this deficit schooling, you know, when there are beliefs there like, it's one thing to reflect on who you are and, and, and have that language, another thing to model it. But then when something happens, what are you doing? When you, my CEO, Eden Mazardoy always says, you know, when you walk into a classroom and you see something that's not right and you walk away, you just set the standard for behavior. You have to confront it and you have to be about how you choose your battles, like which ones you're confronting and why. Uh, so. So that piece there becomes super critical. But this is just in terms of leadership, we just see these really ha tied hand in hand, which is why in some of those scenarios you saw a Spanish speaking parent or you saw, uh, you know, someone coming in to say, hey, they're making fun of my kid's name. You know, what are you going to do about that as a at, at the school? Right. So uh, uh, academics are at the center, but there's so much more also that surround that. My role, chief strategy officer. So I, while I have been those people directly on the ground facilitating the work, 
Um, now I'm at a level um, where I'm really thinking about like what our strategy is at the organizational level, working with my CEO very closely um, and trying to figure out how we're best creating impact, right? For uh, students and for families, teachers, principals, uh, district leaders across the country. Um, and here's kind of how it breaks down the four buckets. Um, and, and it's a lot of jargon. It's a lot of words here. Um, but, but if I'm being honest, because I'm a former school principal, like my comfort level is very much in the day-to-day -day work, right? Um, the work on the ground. So sometimes this isn't always um, the most comfortable for me. In fact, I would say that it's probably a real stretch that I uh, am in this role right now. Um, and, um, and, you know, there's a lot around, um, you know, fundraising and around research impact and evaluation and work around, um, you know, external presence and, um, and, and I've been, I've been, I've given the opportunity to write now and to publish some of our thinking and our work. And a lot of that stuff is very different than, uh, maybe some of the work I used to do just kind of on the ground, uh on a day-to-day -day basis and I'm learning and I'm, I appreciate my CEO for the opportunity to stretch myself outside of my comfort zone and to learn all other parts of the organization. My favorite part is teaching. I'm, I'm there um, sitting with my friends, Pamela and David and Habib um, recently at the Harvard Graduate School of Education is talking about our, our thinking around equity and leadership. That's probably some of my favorite and that goes back to this one here around national presence you know, we're kind of, you're representing your organization on national national stage, you're engaged, or even this work today, right, with Speak Mentorship, that you're you're kind of involved in the community and you're engaged in ways, that, you know, really uh, support your mission around, and our mission is around leadership and equity. Um, <clears throat> this is just a picture of one of the groups I facilitate every summer of district leaders. These are people who support school principals. And the, 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 um, there's a guide next to it that we just literally published about a month ago, and I was one of the co-authors on that, but really trying to uh, put it out there in the field. It's available free on our website, um, but really kind of demystifying the belief of the principal as the superhero, you know, I think is often what happens. You know, they, people come in and, and everyone expects that you are the end-all be-all, when in reality, um, you... Uh, you need a team. You need a team to carry the work forward. Uh, and so we, we we kind of outline it there. But in my new role, I'm able to have time to do that, which is really nice. I never I never had that in the past. It was always kind of the day-to-day -day prayers and, and doing the work. And so now to step back and be a thinker about this work um, and to put some of that thinking in, in writing is a, really a privilege um, that I never expected to have. Now, here's, here's a bit about my trajectory to get to this place of being a chief strategy officer, being on national stage, doing these really important things at this organization based in New York City, but national. And let me take you through this because I want, I, I talked earlier about it really being a nonlinear track. <clears throat> and I want to take you through a little bit of what I mean by that. So look at 1992. This is me back uh, in eighth grade. And I was... Uh, I was what you would call a wannabe chola. So I was, uh, you know, this, this, this young lady, I'm the one to the left, um, who, you know, was pretty, I think I was going through some anger issues in middle school. And, um, and I was associating myself with, um, with a lot of, with a lot of the gang activity in the community. My brother had been involved and had some other family members. And, and you know, it was, it was, it was, um, in, in my, from my perspective, being connected to a, a gang at that time was a smart thing to do. It wasn't something that I, I think I was unthoughtful about or just trying to follow along. But I knew that there was a level of protection that came along with, um, with, with, with interacting with certain people and with doing certain things. That, but although that was a smart move for myself individually, I was definitely not doing anything good for society or the community by being involved. Um, my when I went off to high school, you see the one here, I kind of got into sports and that was really a saving grace for me. I also had an amazing teacher. There were two people in eighth grade when I looked like that. <clears throat> one was my eighth grade teacher, Mr. Lovelace, who was the very first teacher in my life to just to see me, to tell me that I was smart, to tell me that I was capable, to tell me that I could write, 
that he liked the way I was, you know, that he wanted me, he, that he gave me the most improved, you know, award that year. And I also had my older sister who said to me, listen, you're going to come to the high school. It's your chance, your chance to be anyone you want to be. You don't have to continue on this path. You can, if you're happy. Um, but, but I don't see this as a good path for you in your life. And when you come to high school, it's your chance. And if you don't do it now, you're going to get stuck and you're going to get in, in the same patterns over the next four years. Um, and I took her advice and I, and I moved a little bit into the sports arena and it was just a really amazing, I think, decision. I, I needed something else. I needed a different team. Right. Um, and that's my coach, coach Tex Alexander there. Uh, we call him Tex cause he was from Texas, um, but working out in California and with all of his, his Latina girls. Uh, and he was like a father figure to many of us, a really great, great man. Um, and then on the right hand side, and then I, after, um, going through college and such, I became a substitute teacher. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, um, a little later, but, I uh, became a teacher and a principal, and you can see the hills of San Jose, California, which are just so beautiful. I don't get that in New York now. I just see a bunch of buildings, but it's still gorgeous out here. But um, And those are the, the two people next to me, Crystal and Tim. Those were my uh, assistant principals um, out um, uh, at Fisher Middle School. Um, and then you see me in 2013 uh, defending my doctoral dissertation. So that's me defending. You can't see the PowerPoint up. And that's my committee right there uh, sitting in front to, to decide whether or not I was going to pass and get my doctorate. Um, but I but I just wanted to kind of show you those are just four different moments in my life, um, kind of the journey. And um, they're very they're significantly different, all four of those. Uh, and I wanted to present that because I, I just feel like after a while, you know, as going through life, like although I didn't never had like a real goal of being an educator or even getting a doctorate or doing any of this work. Like I think that I connected and surrounded myself with people who really helped to influence me. And I listened, I just paused and listened to people I really trusted such as my sister, such as my eighth grade teacher. Um, and I met a few other folks who just had a huge influence on how I was going to think. And I listened and tried new things. Um, and it took me to extraordinary places when you, when you just throw yourself into the unknown and try it out. And throughout this experience, I've been able to, you know, um, I've been able to influence myself, you know, and because I've had so many great people in my life, I also wanted to do the same. I've had, you know, here are two of my students. Here's Edna Gregorio, uh, who was my middle schooler who just graduated from UC Berkeley and is now traveling the world and will be back to go to law school. And my, uh, my former student, Carlos. Um, and let me show you a little clip of Carlos um, and a little bit about his journey. And actually in this clip, He's actually sitting um, at our school, Fisher Middle School. So I'll just show you about maybe three, two minutes of this video. My name is Carlos. I'm currently a rising sophomore at Harvard University. Um, all right, and to talk a little bit about my experience at Harvard, it's at first it was definitely something different. It wasn't something I was accustomed to. You know, the people were different, and getting used to it was a bit tough, at least at first. But then, kind of get to know people. You know, it's like you talk to them, and you know they're different than you. They come from a different place. They have different experiences. But you know, you kind of learn to accept that, and you appreciate one another, and you just become awesome friends. Which is yeah, cool. so I actually, uh, I was born in Mexico, and uh, I lived there until I was about seven. It was like in this small little town. It was rural, so it was uh, like 10 minutes from the capital, I think, or like 30, actually. But it was just this really small town, and that's pretty much where I had all my family and stuff. And uh, a few years before that, my dad had uh, come to the U.S., and so we decided to join him. Me and my mom, like, packed up everything, and we just left for the U.S., so when I was seven, uh, we get here and like I get to this place and it's just completely different. It's like nothing I've ever seen before. The language, the people, they're all different and unknown, which is kind of scary at the time. Now that I think about it, <laughs> when once there, they told me I had to like learn uh, learn English because I didn't know it at all. I couldn't read in Spanish. I couldn't write or anything, but I could speak Spanish, not English. And so they gave me two weeks to learn English. Um, 
weeks. Two weeks, yeah, it was two weeks learning English. So me and my dad would stay up for like nights on end. And then the teacher I had at the time just told my mom outright that uh, she didn't think I was going to learn anything and she wouldn't, she didn't think I was making it anywhere just because, you know, I didn't know the language, you know, but uh, my dad like was always supportive and stuff. He didn't even know English. <laughs> Uh, but uh, he was just there, and we'd stay up, you know, practicing the different sounds, letter made, and the combinations and such, how to pronounce words and stuff like that. So, I mean, it was it was a good time. <laughs> I don't know. When I was young. I don't think I ever like really had something I wanted to do. Like, I, I don't think I ever really wanted to be like an astronaut or anything. I didn't really have a dream. Uh, I just like when I was growing up, you know, having to add work and stuff. Uh, just kind of like always thought that. Um, you have to be like realistic about things and you know figure out what you're gonna do for a job how you're gonna get money just like just what are you gonna do to pay the rent pay the bills and stuff like that so I don't think I really gave myself the chance to dream or really have any like really big aspirations of sorts and that, that. so that was that's Carlos um, and he he really uh, touched my heart because he <clears throat> All my students did. I have to tell you, I love my my students, um, and now they're they're grown adults. Um, and so you see, Carlos and I in my office um, about two, two years ago. Um, and what happened was, uh, I was sitting in my office on a Friday afternoon, and I travel a lot for work, right? Because we work across the country, and I'm sitting there, and I hear someone walk in a late Friday. Uh, and I heard, uh, but is, is I'm looking for Nancy Gutierrez. Where's Miss G? Where's Miss Gutierrez? And so I, you know, I get up, I'm a former middle school principal. So I, you know, I jump up right away and uh, I'm, 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 I'm walking over to see what's going on. And Carlos is there walking. He's all sweaty and <laughs> he's stressed out. And, and my office is not the easiest to find. You actually have to go through multiple doors and it's not, it's not, it's, it's even the address itself out is, is not the easiest to find, but he sees me and he's like, Miss G, it's me. It's, it's, it's Carlos, it's me. And I did not recognize him at all. And I felt awful about this. And I, but I didn't want to let him know that because I've had so many students. And so I said, oh my gosh, Carlos, you know. So I went along with it and we sit down and he, he, he says to me, wait a minute, you don't know who I am, do you? And I said, I said, you know what, God bless your face does look familiar. And I said, but tell me more about, about when we were together. And he's like, okay, you know, you were my principal at Fisher Middle School. I was, you know, and so we, we started talking about, he goes, and one time I got sent to your office and I got in trouble because I brought firecrackers to school <laughs> and I started cracking up and, um, you know, and he said that, before I left to Harvard uh, to get my doctorate, I brought them in the ca- in the cafeteria and, sh- and told them that um, told them about what I would be doing and said that for them to meet me over there, you know. And he said, "Miss G, I'm here to tell you that I'm here. I came to meet you." And it was one of the most beautiful, I think, moments. I um, Carlos was such a quiet young man. I, I didn't interact with him a ton, and I feel bad about that. Um, but that we were able to that he came to find me years later uh, to let me know how he was doing meant the world. But this is the type of work that sustains you and that you get to, to, to have as part of you go into education and you, you get into this work. Um, and it, it really, it really is special. And, and this is also the type of influence you get to have as a leader, as a school leader. Um, and, you know, teachers do have the greatest impact, but the school leader, guess what? Your, your students know you, they, 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 they remember the things you did, remember the things you said, they remember the, the way you treat them, the whole thing, even when you may not remember every detail of it, they do. Um, so that was one of, uh, and it's an example. Now, one of the topics of this uh, series was around summer internships and jobs and kind of if you're 16, 17 and you're thinking about how do I prepare you know, I again back to being a non-linear track. I actually felt um, um, a little bad about this topic because I was thinking, man, my jobs <laughs> over the summers, um, you know, were things like working at the mall, Champ Sports, or working in a photo studio, or I worked the graveyard shift in college at Super Kmart. Because, um, you know, just earn a little extra cash to make things um, work out in college and to make sure I could stay in college. Um, 
but but I you know I I think that this process going through this process and naming it made me feel really proud. You know, I was a hard worker. I was a hard worker, and I and I did what I had to do uh, to to continue along the path that I needed for me. Uh, and this was what it was for me as I was trying to figure out my life. Uh, and so I'm I'm unapologetic about it now, and it's taking me a little bit of time to get there, but. I, you know, I just, I needed money, I needed money and I needed to work. Uh, and I learned a lot of different things within those spaces, including just being a very responsible young lady um, over time and what it meant to, to earn some money um, and how hard it was to earn money, actually. Um, and in college, I uh, was a groundskeeper. You know, I would wake up early mornings at six, meet the crew, and we would you know, pull weeds and we would put the seeds into the grass and we would, but again, back to this idea that I couldn't just, I didn't have the privilege or luxury of just going to school. I had to work a lot while I was going to college. And that taught me a level of resilience and hard work that I think um, really benefits me today um, later in life. And at the time too, taught me a lot of, kept me humble and taught me a lot of resilience. Um, I've been able a teacher. I also started as an intern um, over the summer, and it, being a teacher is just very, very hard work. Um, and um, and I never thought it would be something that I would do permanently, but I fell in love with it. I was substitute teaching just as a side hustle, as a side job, and fell in love with the kids um, and the work itself, uh, and moved into leadership in the same way. I did, I did take on more sophisticated internships um, in grad school, took me um, to grad school to get to these, to, to get to really being thoughtful about who do I want to spend time with? How, who do I want to learn from? And this is me with Mary Ellen Elia, who's now the New York State Commissioner of Ed um, here, but was at the time I was there in Hillsborough, Florida with my little short red hair and red glasses and the big dork. But uh, I, uh, I spent the summer there with her, um, learning from her and, you know, going into her car and seeing the way she interacted with the media and with, um, with her, with, with, with principals. And, and she was just someone that I really value <clears throat> and really happy that she, we have her in New York state now. Here are some, some tips. I think I want to just quickly take you through, um, I, you know, number one, unapologetically take care of yourself, right? And I think that I talked about this a little bit around my summer internships. Um, it's okay to balance what you need for survival. You don't always have to be like the top this and top that and this internship and that internship. Listen, you got to do you. You got to take care of yourself and you have to figure out what you need to, to do to survive. And believe me, those things that you have to end up doing will not get in the way of your bigger goals. They will not. Um, in fact, they will they will help drive you towards that because you'll learn life lessons. Um, I didn't tell you this, but I, when I was uh, when I was working the graveyard shift at Kmart, I got fired. It's the one and only job I ever uh, got fired from. And man, I can't tell you what that taught me. And it well, had nothing to do with me being irresponsible or anything doing anything wrong. But it was the first time I experienced like organizational politics, even at that level. Um, but it taught me a ton and it felt really bad and I was a young kid. And so I was, you know, upset about it, but can I tell you that it really taught me a lot about life. Um, the second thing I would say is to try things on. Now this is, this time in your life is one of the only times that you'll be able to really experiment without judgment. Like at my age right now, I'm 38 years old. I can't necessarily say, Oh, let me try this career. Let me try that. Let me try this. Like I have to be responsible. I have to worry about my family. I have to do things in life that, are really gonna kind of move me forward. And sure, I have flexibility, a little bit of it, but not as much as when you when you're younger. You can just try things on. You can um, you can observe a doctor in practice or an attorney, or you can say, "Hey, what does he do?" Or you can attend these uh, sessions to learn about the different things people do um, to see if it might be a fit for you or if you can exper you know experience it. Number three, the relationships that you build throughout life are the things that will sustain you. You know, you hold on to your your family and friends and all of that, but you, but you, the networks you create in college and in school and in high school, hold on to those, nurture those. Even if it takes work, nurture them. Find good people and stick with good people. They will, um, they will take care of you later, and you'll take care of them. 
Uh, and four, maintain humility in all you do, right? You have to have an attitude of gratitude, always show appreciation, always say thank you, never take anything for granted. And I think uh, you do that and you you will be on a good path. Um, stay active as well. I do a lot of things outside of being a chief strategy officer. I do a lot of things and unapologetically, a lot of things for the Latino community. Um, you know, next weekend I will be with a new organization called Latinos for Education, where they're taking aspiring Latino leaders between age 26 to 35, and they're giving them an opportunity for a year to fellowship and network and to really grow. And I will be one of their first teachers um, uh, for their launch, the launch of their program. And, you know, they had tons of applicants and only a select few were chosen. And, you know, those things nurture my soul in a way that my, my, my formal job doesn't, my formal job certainly is something I love to do. Um, and I love working with, you know, principals and designing learning and, and with my organization, but to actually be on the ground working with my people, with mi gente, like that, that inspires me in a way that I can't even tell you. Uh, and, and this piece I wanted to show too, these are my best friends since I was, uh, very young, some of them since I was in kindergarten. Uh, and that's something that you have to always hold on to that. You never forget your homies. You never forget your family. You never forget the people that mean the world to you that helped you grow up, that knew you as uh, a little rascal and that saw you, um, and that can, that can, that know your family and that can see you for everything you are beyond, um, you know, a Harvard graduate or a chief strategy officer, whatever formal roles come with that. Um, and finally, uh, to take inspiration wherever you go, the picture I showed you of my grandma, it's right there. If you see in the back, I always either open or close with a tribute to the people that, um, that have inspired me and brought me to where I am today. And uh, my one of my professors, Dr. Deborah Jill Sherman, always says that to me. She says, always end with inspiration. Whatever you do, you bring it back to what matters and why it matters beyond some of the skill. And so I, I give you the same advice. And here's Sonia Sotomayor, who's another inspiration, you know, the first Latina Supreme Court justice. And I actually don't know her, uh, but I bumped into her, believe it or not, at a restaurant in New York City um, <clears throat> last summer. And um, I asked the waiter to, because uh, in New York City, you can't necessarily go and stalk people. Like there's just, there are lots of people who, important people everywhere and they want to have a life. And so I asked, uh, you don't want to go and like ask for an autograph or anything. So I asked the waiter if he could ask her if she could come and say hello on her way out. And he did. And she said yes. And we waited there for about three hours. And she came by and said hello you know, hugged us, took pictures with us, and we told her how much of an inspiration she was to us um, in our lives, being out there representing uh, women of color. Uh, and it was just really special. And she's definitely an inspiration to me, uh, to many people. Um, and uh, Dario Collado, a buddy of mine, he always says, when you take the elevator up in life, you should always send it back down for others to follow. I believe that truly. Um, Finally, keep in mind three things. Um, this is important. Whatever this is, you define this. Uh, for me, define my definition of this is around like how do leaders get better and better at what they do for the sake of our kids and our communities, and more specifically, community and and com communities um, uh, that struggle. Um, the second one is that you can do it. Um, and we need a team back to this idea of power and numbers. Everyone is part of this work to make it happen. And, and, and I will give up on you that you have people who believe in you, people who see your beauty uh, and rely on them as you move forward to this work. Here's my email address if you want to be in touch. Okay. And I will turn it back over to Speak Mentorship to introduce, to, for any questions that may have come up or to introduce the next speaker. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Gutierrez. Um, that was so inspirational. Um, we are gonna open it up for questions. We have about um, five minutes. If anyone does have questions, please unmute your line or um, 
or send them over to either Dr. Gutierrez or to me. Uh, while you are forming your questions, I would like to mention that the next speaker series is on May 13th, and uh, we will be featuring uh, Rebecca Gross. She is the founder of Student Driven Solutions, so please make sure to join us um, in about two weeks um, for, for her presentation. Um, so, Dr. Gutierrez, that was amazing. Um, as, you know, as first generation immigrants, I think a lot of us can relate to some of the stories that you've shared. Um, I think more generally, um, what, you know, you talked about institutional biases and, you know, um, speaking up against it and confronting it. What if we aren't even aware that we're being subject to that kind of biases? You know, um, a lot of times we just assume that things are the way that they are. But as women and as immigrants, um, do you have any advice in terms of what what are the red flags like what should we be looking for in order to you know um to like if you know do we just speak up when we feel uncomfortable or do you think that um because you know there is institutional bias that we have become comfortable with so how do we recognize that how do we how do we recognize that this is not okay this is not right you know, it's a great, it's a great question. And first of all, I should say that, the, that you can't escape it. I, that's what I would say. I, you know, it's hard, you know, it, the higher I go in this work, the more likely it is that I'm going to sit at a table and be the only woman of color, or only person of color uh, sitting there um, with a group of, you know, 15, 20, you know, uh, uh, and that becomes really hard. So I think I can't say that I have to look out and notice. I have to just say, there it's in the room it exists and there are little things that i have to do to really just own who i am uh in that process for example i'll be honest with you like i was at a meeting you know earlier this week and i questioned should i straighten my hair or a lot of us <laughs> got some big hair it's all i have big curly hair and um and and the the the, the um what is it the standard for beauty that has been set in our country is around, you know, straight hair and around light skin and around the way you speak, you know, with no accent and, you know, all that stuff. And, um, you know, I went with the curly hair, like these are, these are little things. They might sound silly, but I'm sure there are things you've thought about, especially when you're interacting in spaces where people don't look like you. Uh, another thing is like, the Latina thing around big earrings, like I, I, I wear big earrings, like and I've taken them off and I've tried to like look a little bit more like, you know, kind of white middle class in certain settings. And I'm thinking, no, no, I'm going to be myself. I'm going to, I'm going to be myself and I'm going to, I'm going to share what kind of knowledge I have. And the third thing I would say is around how I speak. I used to um, get all the time people say, oh, where are you from? You have this accent or, or whatever. Um, I never knew I had an accent when, where I came from, but I think I learned I think I lost that accent over time. And, and I also think I started, I tried very hard to speak a certain way to use certain words to sound smart. And now I just talk, I just talk whatever comes out of my heart, however I feel you have to know how to code switch. though, even with the, the big earrings or the big hair or the way you, you got to earn your stripes and your credibility because know that the biases will be stacked against you. Know that when you walk in, people may not expect um, for you to be, everything you are, all the beauty that you bring, they may not see it immediately. And you have to, so I've had to, you know, I would say I've had to walk the line a bit. Um, in some settings I've had to walk in and enter in, in an uncomfortable way that maybe wasn't me um, until I approved myself and then I was able to be myself. But I, I think the answer to that question is it's going to be there. Uh, the red flags are everywhere. They're there. And you have to just figure out, you have to have the, your own you know, the level of emotional intelligence to deal with them. And to figure out what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Um, thank you for that. Uh, there's another question that we have. Um, the question is, what major during undergrad would someone consider to pursue a career like yours? You know what I did? I, I'm telling you, nonlinear, I did psychology. Honestly, it was because I didn't know what the hell to do. You know, I was just kind of, I knew I had to go to college. That's all I knew. And I knew I had to graduate. 
um, what really mattered for me was my grad school. And then after that, you know, I ended up going to UC Davis to get a teaching credential. Um, and then after that, I went to San Jose State to get become a school principal, get an admin. So for me, my more focused um, work didn't come until grad school versus undergrad. I do see people who, you know, end up uh, getting a degree in liberal arts or something, or um, I think I think that leads to kind of education space. In my role right now, um, a lot of the people I supervise have business majors because we're talking about fundraising and we're talking, or, you know, we're talking about marketing, you know, people who are in PR or marketing. So I don't know. I really don't have an answer to that other than um, explore what you think will make you happy. Uh, and um, and you're going to probably have to go to grad school to get more targeted around around the exact direction. Okay, um, I believe that concludes the questions uh, for this session. Um, I think Dr. Gutierrez had a slide up there uh, with her contact information. So if anyone wants to contact her regarding, you know, more details um, from what she presented today, more about the New York City Leadership Academy, or just in general want to get more information from her, please feel free to contact her. And um, please join us in two weeks for Rebecca Gross. Um, there it is again. Thank you. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. It's a beautiful day out here on the East Coast. <laughs> uh, thank you all. Thank you.